Good evening, everybody. Hello. Um, welcome to our live deep sky tour from McDonald Observatory. Uh, my name is Stephen Hummel. Uh, I'm the Dark Skies Initiative Coordinator for McDonald Observatory, and uh, I am joined tonight by Saul Rivera. Hello, Saul. Hey, Stephen. Yeah, so tonight uh, we are going to be kind of celebrating International Dark Skies Week a bit early. So next week, April 15th through 22nd, 2023, is International Dark Skies Week. So that's an annual celebration of the night sky and everything in it, as well as an appreciation of, of kind of natural darkness and the benefits it brings, not only to stargazing, but to the environment and more. Um, so uh, if you are in the area next week, uh, April 18th through 22nd, that's Dark Skies Week at McDonald Observatory. So we've got a lot of programs going on you can check out. Um, but tonight we're going to be kind of celebrating uh, our dark skies uh, through this program. Uh, we're going to show you some targets through a telescope, show you some live views of some deep sky objects, far away things. Uh, and um, that's going to be Brought to you by Saul, who is at the telescope right now. Hi, Saul. Hey, Steven. Yeah, so my again, my name is Saul Rivera. I'm one of the public program specialists here. So you've probably seen me in past live streams, help do tours and star parties and streams like this. And tonight I'm the telescope operator. So right now I'm located inside one of the domes of our visitor center here in the McDonald Observatory Visitor Center. So kind of where the little red arrow is, is where I'm currently located. And it's pretty dark in here. So the reason I look kind of weird and why my eyes look really spooky if I look directly into the camera is because the camera is actually an infrared camera, a ther thermal camera. I'm trying to remember which one this is even? Thermal, infrared? Near infrared. Near infrared. infrared okay. but not heat yet. Okay. So close in both ways. <laughs> So yeah, so currently the, so that's how y'all can see me. Actually, my jacket is kind of like a dark brown, then this line looks white. And behind me is one of our telescopes. So you can make out a little bit of it, such as the mount it's on and part of the telescope itself. We, we do actually have, do have a better picture of it. So that's a better picture of the dome we're using. There's a 16 inch reflecting telescope it's uh, Mala's Richie Crichton, and it's the one we'll be using tonight. So with this telescope, where the eyepiece should be in the bottom, we have put a camera, and now that camera is connected to the computer, and now we can show you what the telescope's seeing. And we got a good number of objects tonight. So, Stephen, what's our first target for the night? Um, yeah, uh, our first target for tonight is called NGC 2440. Um, I should add, if you've got any questions during this program, be sure to put them in the live chat if you're watching live. Uh, and we have some moderators in the chat who can answer some of your questions. And we'll also be answering some questions at the end of the program. Uh, well, Saul and I will. Uh, and uh, I was also during the program as uh, we see fit. Um, so again, don't be afraid to put your questions in the chat at any time. So uh, our first target for this evening is called NGC 2440, everyone's favorite, right? Just rolls off the tongue. Uh, now, uh, NGC stands for New General Catalog, and there are many things in the New General Catalog. This particular object is located up in an obscure constellation called Puppis, which is currently pretty high up in the sky, uh, we're looking kind of in the direction of Mars uh, at the moment from McDonald Observatory. So if you can look up in the sky and find Mars, we're looking kind of off near that direction a little bit to the north of it. Um, so NGC 2440 is a planetary nebula. And if you're not familiar, familiar with that, well, Saul is going to explain. Do we have a view, Saul? Yes, yeah, so I do have a view of this planetary nebula. Let's right. clearing that up. So there we go. So there's NGC 2440. So what that kind of looks like clouds and sort of just kind of stretching out and a little bit to the bottom top and uh, top top left bottom right is the nebula itself. So a nebula is basically a giant cloud of gas and dust and space. 
usually there are stars or stars inside of it lining it up from the inside out. Lang is actually seen a nebula. A planetary nebula is what's created when the star like our sun dies. So what happens is when the when the star like our sun reaches the end of its life, it starts fusing heavier elements at its core, which causes the star to grow into what we call a red giant star. When our sun becomes a red giant in the next 5 billion years or so, it will grow past Mercury, Venus, Earth, some say could even reach Mars. Then it'll begin to run out of energy and shrink little by little, kind of pulsating and pushing its outer layers away, as it does, until just the core is left, which we call a white dwarf star. Little bitty star about the size of planet Earth. Now all the gas is still there, though, from when the star was still alive. And the leftover gas the from, that was there when the star was still alive, well, oh, actually, rephrase that, so the leftover gas is there from when the star was still alive, when it's been pushed away, and the leftover core is still so energetic, it's actually able to light up the gas around it, causing it to light up and see this formation. The reason this is called a planetary nebula is that we first thought, astronomers first thought, this is where planets formed. We know that isn't true anymore, but the name stuck, which is a kind of pretty common thing in astronomy. So this ne planetary nebula is about 4,000 light years away from us. For reference, one light year is about 6 trillion miles away. So you can say this nebula is getting to about 24 quadrillion miles away from us. So 24 followed by 15 zeros. Hope you all have your favorite movies packed for that trip. And you might also notice that it's very bright, but it's still being a cloud. Looks kind of, it looks almost like the light's kind of filtered. As you notice to the bottom right of the nebula, you see a really bright star. You see it kind of looks like some cross beams to it. The star's like just coming straight towards us. It's actually bright enough. It's spanning around the mounts of the telescope's secondary mirror, which is why it gives us that, that kind of crosshair shape. But the nebula itself, doesn't have those beams. It's the cloud around it is diffusing a bit of the light, not making it as direct or intense, and actually letting us see the features of the nebula better. And that's actually something we can actually apply down here to Earth as well. So. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So um, yeah, just this is a great view. Again, it's live. Uh, your real photons hitting the camera, stream to you. Uh, here is a previously taken image from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, obviously, it has a much smaller field of view. It gets a little closer to the action, a little more detail. Um, lots of colors. But as Saul just described, there is a very bright, intense star at the middle of this. But really what makes this so beautiful is everything around it, right? All of the, the cloud of gas and things reflecting uh, and absorbing and re-emitting the light or fluorescing. Um, so again, all that material was once part of the star. And the reason we can really appreciate it is because the star itself isn't outshining it. Um, so if you, to make an analogy, if we look at sort of real world light fixtures, uh, well, we have shielded lights and unshielded lights. Um, if you look at an unshielded light, like a typical floodlight, you, there's a lot of light coming out, you coming directly at you. Kind of like a typical star, really. It's just emitting light in all directions in any particular way um, compared to a shielded fixture where the light is a little more controlled and you can see the surroundings around that uh, light better because you aren't looking directly at the source. So just as how it helps appreciate the view of NGC 2440, uh, same kind of thing happens you know, just on everyday light fixtures. The ones that are shielded and aimed down towards the target of illumination allow us to see the surroundings better. Uh, and it also, of course, helps preserve our view of the night sky um, by not aiming light upwards into, into the sky. Uh, we help preserve our view of the stars. So uh, we like shielded pictures around here. Uh, everyone um, here is happy to uh, preach their benefits because it, it saves the sky and you see better. Um, all right, so while Saul is moving the telescope to our next target, which is one of my uh, favorite 
um, pairs of galaxies in the sky. Um, if anyone's got any questions uh, for us, please be sure to put them in the chat. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and answer this one. I see from John Gianforte. Um, John asks, at some point, can you describe the telescope design again? And also, what type of mount is the telescope on? Also, what is the latitude of McDonald Observatory? I'll do the easiest one first. Our latitude is about 30 degrees north. Um, so uh, that uh, gives us a great view of the northern hemisphere and a decent view of some of the things further south as well, 30 degrees north. Um, the telescope design is a Ritchie Christian. It's a uh, reflector telescope. So there's just two mirrors, a big primary one, 16 inches across, and a secondary one at the top. Uh, what makes the, the telescope special is that those two mirrors are very precisely ground to a certain shape uh, with high precision. Um, and since there's just two mirrors, as opposed to a bunch of lenses or other things, less light is lost with only two reflections as, a poor, as opposed to uh, a more complicated design, which may not be as efficient. Uh, the mount is a computerized German equatorial mount. Uh, it's a Paramount ME. Uh, and I should also add, if you've got other tech questions, uh, we do have a little blurb in the video description uh, that kind of talks a little bit about, you know, the specifics of the products and, and, and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, this telescope, um, it, it could be used for research. It is research grade, um, but we do have some bigger ones we use for that instead. So it's really just here for uh, y'all's enjoyment. And this is also one, if you do visit in person at a star party, you can you can actually look through the IP, so. Uh, all right, um, so again, our target, uh, next target is NGC uh, 4038 and NGC 4039. These are also known as the antennae galaxies for reasons that will become uh, pretty clear in a moment. Um, how are we doing, Solo? Are we almost there? Uh, we got in the view. All right, go ahead and put it up when you're ready. All right, so here we have the antennae galaxies. So as you see, these galaxies are a bit of a weird shape. When you think of a galaxy, you usually think of something like the Milky Way, a nice little disk kind of with some spill spiral arms. This one looks like if the gal two galaxies just crashed together and you're seeing kind of a little mess from that. And you'd be right. The antenna galaxies are actually two galaxies that are in the process of merging and colliding. When galaxies collide in space, is isn't really much of like a head-on collision, as you might think of more like a vehicle or something, but more of like two clouds of gas or smoke getting blown into each other. They get blown into each other and swirl around as they do and then kind of drift apart. Then if there's enough gravity, they get pulled back in, swirl some more, and they keep going until they can merge into a new galaxy. So in the galaxy, you can make out there's some really bright centers. So these are kind of the centers, the cores of the galaxy. You can make out a bit of their spiral arms that they had. Really bright regions in these usually means there has been new stars forming as the galaxies are colliding and merging. You're forcing the clouds of gas together, and as they can force together, that can create new stars. Now, you might be noticing every now and then it seems to be getting a little bit darker, and you're seeing a little bit more of it. So something we're doing with some of our objects that we're doing with the camera is called live stacking. Basically, as the camera is taking images, it's putting them on top of each other to improve the details we can see and the amount we can see. So one thing you might notice as we're getting more and more light, a bit more darker and such, and that one might be a bit too dark. So let me just the settings a bit, make it not that bright. There it goes. So something I do want to show off a bit, moving the view a little bit upwards, is the reason it's called the antenna galaxies. So you might notice up uh, if you look towards the sides of the colliding galaxies, you see a streak of almost looks like light, kind of bending over this way, and our one going over this way. So as the galaxies are colliding, the dust and gas getting moved around, and in this case, makes it look like an insect with antennas. 
These galaxies themselves are located about 45 million light years away, and the, the, the span of it is almost half a million light years, so pretty big. And so, uh, again, they're known as the antenna galaxies. That's their nickname. In the space, we like to give things nickname. Other name we give it is the ringtail galaxy. So we really like to see animal, animal, animal names sometimes for here in space. And the animals, like insects and such, and some other creatures don't even apply to space or like of space, not only in naming things, but just or. You know what? Might be better for Steven to go over <laughs> how, how the connection between the yeah. the antenna galaxy and how that can help us. Yeah, here. antennas of all kinds. Yeah. So yeah. here's another <laughs> image previously taken um, showing off the antennae, so to speak, uh, drifting off a little, a little more. I should also add that the camera we're using for the live views is black and white because black and white cameras are more sensitive. So we can get more detail faster. Uh, but we get, and uh, if time isn't an issue, then we can add uh, the color in. Um, so you can kind of see those two trails coming off of these two galaxies, these so-called antennae. So um, uh, I like antennae of a different kind. Whenever I see the uh, antennae galaxies, I think of them as kind of like a like a moth antennae kind of sticking out. Um, and around this time of year in far west Texas, in the Chihuahuan Desert, we have, uh, you'll, if you drive around at the daytime, you will certainly notice our agave, which are often flowering, um, our yuccas as well, uh, yuccas and agave, which are uh, flowering around this time of year. Um, and if you see a yucca, which uh, really distinctive plants, very spiny, uh, they kind of have like, um, spine balls on stalks and kind of flower clusters coming up coming off of them around this time of year. Um, know that uh, there are uh, there's a specific kind of moth, a yucca moth, that um, is really responsible for their survival. Um, agave and yucca are two species that uh, attract a lot of pollinators out here. Uh, and yucca in particular are entirely dependent on yucca moths for pollination. And yucca moths basically have evolved to um, kind of tolerate some of the chemicals in these plants uh, that kind of deter almost all other insects. Uh, and they're the sole pollinators of yuccas, hence the name yucca moth. So without yucca moths, there would be no yuccas. Without yuccas, there would be no yucca moths, most likely as well. Um, but of course, moths and uh, many other nocturnal insects uh, you find out here at night are very sensitive to artificial light. Uh, when you see moths and things flocking around an artificial light source, um, they may, they're usually confused. Uh, there are different reasons why insects are attracted to light, and it's actually kind of debated why, you know, moths are so attracted to light. One theory is that they orient themselves to relative to the moon and the stars and are sensitive to that. So when they see a really bright light source, they get very confused about which way is up and down and they kind of circle around it helplessly. Um, uh, there are other reasons that, that uh, insects may be attracted to light. But in general, when you see uh, insects, especially moths swarming around an artificial light, uh, they are not gonna survive till morning. Uh, it will kill them. They are they are starving themselves to death. And every moment that they're circling that light is time it, they're not spending uh, pollinating plants like yuccas and other things. Uh, and a recent study found that even just the sky glow, the dispersed light from near a major city is actually enough to disturb yucca moths and other kinds of moths. I should also say there are many kinds of yucca moths and not all of them are nocturnal, but all of them are still affected by light pollution, even if they're not nocturnal because they believe that it's daytime uh, if there's artificial light. So um, yeah, even just the, the glow of a little bit of light nearby can actually affect the survival of pollinators and thus plants in the desert. Uh, another, I mentioned earlier, another really famous plant, kind of a symbol of our region of Texas uh, in, the, in the Chihuahuan Desert is the agave, uh, particularly the Havard agave, 
uh, which are also called locally century plants um, because anecdotally they bloom once every century, so they say, uh, and then they die. In reality, it's anywhere between three and 21 years, not a century, but still it's a big deal when they, they shoot up these stalks really quickly uh, full of, of uh, plenty of nectar uh, for all sorts of creatures. Um, the main pollinator of agave are bats, and bats are heavily dependent on the super sugary nectar uh, you can find in them. So if you've got one of these growing outside your house, uh, look outside at night for bats. So you might catch some. Um, all, we can all, you can also find other creatures as well, uh, like raccoons. They like to climb up there and just eat all, all the stuff up in the, <laughs> and all the nectar, uh, as well as ringtails, which are really similar to raccoons. Another ra uh, cute um, kind of relative of a raccoon that's uh, strictly nocturnal. Um, so all sorts of things going on at night, especially in the desert of the Big Bend region. Uh, it may be dark, but that doesn't mean that, that nature has gone to bed. Um, all these things, of course, very sensitive to artificial light. Uh, next up on our targets, we are going to look at Messier 101, also known as the Pinwheel Galaxy. It's got many names. Uh, M101 uh, is a large galaxy that's relatively close as far as galaxies go. And so compared to the other things, it's going to really fill the whole field of view of the telescope. I'm really excited for this one. Uh, are we ready, Soul? We are. All right. So oh, I should just know, yeah. if you can find the Big Dipper, you can find this galaxy, at least where it is in the sky. It's just below the handle of the Big Dipper. Uh, but it is pretty faint. Uh, I tried to look at this from St. Louis once when I was first starting out, thinking, oh, that's a big galaxy. It should be easy. No, you really have to have dark skies to appreciate it. Yeah, and even with dark skies, it, if it isn't dark enough, it might just look like a fuzzy star in the sky. But once you actually put in a big telescope, have a dark sky, and can look at it properly, you get something more like this. So here is M101 of the Pinwheel Galaxy. Your kind of nice traditional spiral galaxy with long spiral arms. This galaxy is about 21 million light years away from us. And it's about a bit bigger than Milky Way, being about 170,000 light years across. Our Milky Way is about 100,000. And the Pinwheel Galaxy contains about a trillion stars. You might notice the center of the galaxy is very bright. That's where usually a lot of the stars for this galaxy for galaxies are. Also, there's supermassive black holes. And the arms, you can see the arms of gas and dust giving the arms shape. And you notice inside the arms, there are some really bright regions, such as this one here, over here, over here. These really bright regions usually indicate there's lots of star formation going on. Lots of brand new stars are forming in there, which kind of lights up the entire area. And they're kind of nicely grouped up and scattered around. So they, you could sometimes astronomers can use this kind of as a map. They see the star forming regions, know where there's a more concentration of stars, of star formation, and can help them find out more details about the galaxy itself. And sky maps such as these are actually used here on Earth. So instead of looking up towards the sky, things in the sky can look down towards Earth and get a similar way of distributing light across a map. Yeah, yeah. So um, I wanted to throw in this question right now. Bob Remmels asked, how many images is stacked in that view right now? Yeah, so in this view right now, we have a minute long exposure going on. And currently there have been five of those images stacked. So it's been stacked a total exposure of about five minutes so far and actually make that six minutes now just add another one that's an awesome view that's really cool i love all the yeah. detail you can see out in the spiral arms those little clumps yeah that's that's incredible yeah and even inside like the, the galaxy itself you can see where gas is thicker than the rest giving you almost this kind of like almost like veins inside the galaxy of just darker areas of gas blocking up some of the light almost like a little 
roads and trails of sorts. So cool. Yeah. So here's a color image just to uh, show you what this galaxy looks like in color. It's very colorful. Um, and where it really stands out are those pink regions out in the arms. Those are star forming regions where new stars are actively being born in tremendous groups. Um, you can kind of think of if the galaxy is a country, uh, all of the pink blobs are kind of the major cities. Uh, and then maybe the core is like the biggest city, the New York City or so. Uh, but there's still a lot of activity even out in sort of the suburbs and the, the rural area as well. There's still a lot of stars and thus still a lot of light um, in those regions. So when I see a view of a galaxy like M101, I I'm always reminded of kind of views of the Earth from space, uh, looking down on the Earth, seeing the major urban centers and all the other towns as well from all the light uh, going up into space. Um, but of course, you know, it, it's, it's, this image is undeniably beautiful, right? It's, it's hard to deny the, the beauty of the Earth at night from space. Um, but it does have sort of a dark side to it. Um, all of this light is, of course, just wasted light. It's light that's going up into space rather than illuminating things on the ground. Um, so in other words, you know, anywhere you see that light is an area you're not going to have a dark sky. Uh, this is a view from the International Space Station uh, as it was kind of almost above our region of Texas, uh, of Fort Davis, uh, Alpine, Marfa, which you can kind of see in the, the bottom of the field of view there, just to make a, a full screen for you. So looking out um, from this view from the space station, you can see uh, the major cities of Houston, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, uh, as well as lots of other lights, uh, even in sort of rural areas. So I've circled two regions there, the Permian Basin and the Eagle Ford Shale. Uh, and those are oil and gas producing regions. So it goes to show that even in rural areas, that it doesn't mean it's dark, at least not anymore. Um, this is another view of just Texas. This is edited though. This is a view that is showing where there's more light than you would expect for the amount of people that live there. In other words, greater levels of light pollution uh, per capita. Um, so if you look at the major cities like Dallas and Houston, their cores look dark except for the major interstate freeways, right? Uh, because although there is a lot of light there and those dark patches, there's not necessarily more light than you would expect for the population. So everywhere else is where there's more light than you would expect. Um, and of course, those two regions really stand out of um, the, uh, the Eagle Forge Shale and the Permian Basin. Um, so those are two of the largest oil producing um, areas in the, in the world now, but actually there's a lot more going on there as well. Um, so um, anyway, that's a, just a, we'll, I'll touch back on this later on about uh, what we're actually doing about this topic uh, in, in later on, but just going to show that light pollution isn't really related with population anymore um, when we look at it uh, from this view. Uh, our next target is called the Silver Streak Galaxy. Uh, and uh, it's another pair of galaxies. We've got lots of galaxies this time of year available to look at. Uh, also known as NGC 4216. Uh, but hopefully they're actually going to be, there's one going to be one big galaxy and then another part near, partner nearby. Uh, it's currently in the eastern half of the sky in a relatively empty area uh, near the constellation of Leo. Uh, the brightest star in this, this area is Arcturus, uh, down uh, below it. So um, pretty empty patch of the sky. You really need to have dark skies to appreciate this galaxy as well. Um, how are we doing, Solo? Are we almost there? Just a little bit more, but actually, since we're talking about like the cities and we talked about them, actually, there's a question that came in actually before we started. So from Louis Rudmani, Rudma, actually Rudmano, uh, so grew up and live in Marble Falls. The once sparsely populated ranches between Marble Falls, Falls and Austin is now a sea of houses along Highway 71 northwest of Austin. What negative impact is this growth having on our area of Texas? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look anywhere in that region of Texas, there's there's exponential growth, right? It, it's growing very quickly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, light pollution is growing quickly because of the spread of uh, of people, right? More people moving out to uh, some more urban sprawl. Um, but really, what's really accelerating light pollution and why we're losing the nights, why many people can't see the night sky anymore is because people just use more light than they used to. Um, light pollution is growing about 10% per year in North America, but the population growth rate is only about 1% per year. So in other words, light pollution is currently growing 10 times faster than the rate of population. Um, so it's, it's definitely having a negative effect, not only on stargazing, but on, on wildlife um, and pollinators, especially migratory birds and things like that. Um, so I do have, I'll talk a little bit later on about kind of what we're doing about that problem and how you can help as well. So stay tuned for that. All right. I so see some we, galaxies in there. Yep. We got them in view. So here we got NGC 4216. Also, also known as a Silver Street Galaxy. So that's a really bright galaxy on the left. The galaxy is about 55 million light years away from us about 100,000 light years across, so similar to our own Milky Way, and actually contains about 700 globular star clusters, these very tightly packed, dense star group, clusters of stars. And that's a lot more than Milky Way itself. As Stephen kind of mentioned, we also have another galaxy in view. We actually have a little friend of his, NGC 4206, you know, really good buddies, got 42 in both of their names. They must have, bonded, must have bonded over it. The 4206 is a bit further away, being about 70 million light years away. And actually, they aren't the only ones. We can actually make out some other galaxies in this view. So we got a very faint distant galaxy over here. You can see a little bit of a disk shape there. This one may also be a galaxy. And actually, I was positioning the galaxies in the view. We got a little spiral one here in the bottom. You can even make out a bit of its arms. Oh, wait. Yeah, a bit of its wow, that's arms. that's cool. Look at that yeah. little guy. Yeah. Well, its name is, sadly, I don't know. But it's a pretty cool face on spiral galaxy. Some other things you might notice is just how bright the cores are. With 4216, you notice it's it almost looks like a beam, like like kind of like if you're looking like at a UFO from underneath and like the center light is going to come down on in. And the one 4206, its core isn't as bright. Part of it could be the distance. Another could just be how many stars there are in the core. So the core of the galaxies, as I mentioned earlier, is where a lot of where a lot of little of stars kind of group together. Not little stars, a lot of stars of many sizes in the black hole. And galaxies can have different size core. Usually the different size of the core, the bigger the core, the brighter it is, the more intense the light coming off of it. And light intensity isn't only a thing used when we're looking at galaxies. We also use light intensity when we're working with the dark skies. Yeah, so yeah. So here's an, a color image of uh, the, this group of galaxies, really. There's, there's quite a few in there. Um, the um, brightest, of course, being in the center, but we saw the one on the right, but this view also shows that there's another galaxy, another one on the upper left. Lots of galaxies in here. Um, but yeah, you can see that the galaxy in the middle uh, is brighter than the rest, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is maybe it is just emitting more light, but probably a, the main reason is that it is just closer and therefore more intense. Um, and we can kind of determine the distance from uh, a light source based, if we know how bright it is, based on how it appears to be. Uh, and this is related to what physicists call the inverse square law. And if you've taken physics before, you may recall this from high school or something. Um, but the further away you get from a light source, the dimmer it's going to be. That's intuitive. Um, but basically, the inverse square law says that if you double the distance to an object, it won't be half as bright. It will be a quarter as bright. If you triple the distance, it will be uh, one ninth 
as bright. So again, that's the inverse square law. The further away you get, the faster it gets dimmer, right? But, well, the, the dimmer it gets, but not at the rate you would expect. So, um, but the, the key thing here is that it never really goes to zero, right? It, it gets dimmer, but it's not like after a certain point, the light completely ceases, unless there's something there to absorb or block or scatter the light. Um, so this property means that if you can gather enough light, you can see things incredibly far away, which is great for astronomy, right? That's kind of the basis of all of modern astronomy is just the fact that, yeah, it, it's dimmer, but it's never zero, right? It never completely goes away. So um, that's great for astronomers to study incredibly distant things. We can construct massive telescopes to observe things billions of light years away, taking advantage of this fact that it never goes to truly zero. But of course, the same property of light applies here on Earth. So when we look down at um, light sources, uh, they too will never really truly disappear unless something is there to physically block them. Um, a lot of people, when they visit uh, the observatory at night, if they go to the top of the mountain, they look out in the distance and they're like, what are all those lights? Uh, and they're really surprised to hear their car headlights from dozens of miles away. Um, you can clearly see them if you have a clear line of sight uh, from incredible distances. In this image, the cars are 35 miles away, uh, but on a clear, good night with stable air, I've seen car headlights from 40, 50 miles away from here down to the road towards uh, Presidio, which is a pretty incredible distance. So again, those the, the headlights, they never really stop. They just get dimmer, but never to, to nothing. Um, even all the way down in Big Bend National Park, um, looking to the north, uh, if there's a bit of haze over the Permian Basin area, you can actually see the glow from that 130 miles away. Um, so, in fact, there's really nowhere left in Texas you can go and have no artificial light at all, um, if you have a clear view of the horizon, at least. Um, just because you can still see these lights from incredible distances. They're dim, right? You can still see the stars, too, but they're still, they're still out there. So, um, here is a map of the United States uh, made by the National Park Service that kind of shows how far you have to go to completely get away from any trace of artificial light. Uh, and if you look anywhere on the eastern half of the United States, sorry, you're just kind of out of luck. Um, there's really nowhere to actually dark left on the eastern half. On the left half, or the western, uh, there are a few dark places left, one of which is Big Bend region. Uh, of Texas and Mexico. Uh, the other is in Nevada. We've got kind of a pocket in the middle of Nevada as well as in northern Nevada slash Oregon and a little bit up in uh, Montana. But that's kind of it for the continental United States. Um, this map, again, is from the National Park Service uh, called the All Sky Light Pollution Ratio Map. If you Google light pollution maps, you will be taken to other maps, which if you ask me, are not as accurate. This much more uh, accurately reflects reality and how the light scatters and how far you have to really go to see zero light. So again, this is National Park Service, ALR. If you Google that, you can find this map on ArcGIS. Um, all right, so uh, next up, we've got a, a, a target that you actually can see pretty well, even from a light polluted area as most people live in. Uh, called Messier, Messier 3, and M3 for short is a globular star cluster, and uh, probably one of the brighter things we're looking at this evening. You can actually see it without a telescope under dark skies, but with a telescope you can see it um, pretty well even, even in the city. So do we have a view yet, Saul? Yep, we do. Yeah, and for me personally, this is one of my favorites. So can I mentioned earlier, globular star clusters are groups of very very tightly compact group of stars. And we mean very tightly packed. We mean tightly packed. There are actually about half a million stars in this area. So what happens is stars are born inside what we call a star forming nebulae. So we're seeing the picture of something like the Orion Nebula, pairs of creation, Swan Nebula. Those are good examples of some. 
So with the, in the star forming nebulae, hydrogen gas is kind of clumping together naturally. Kind of like, like a snowball. You run the, roll the snowball around the snow, get more and more snow. The ball gets bigger and bigger, more and more massive. Same thing is happening with this, these clouds of gas. That gas is coming together, gets more and more gas, gets more and more massive. Eventually you get to a point where there's so much gas, so tightly compact together. Basically, it's fusing atoms together. It's for squeeze them together. Nuclear fusion, which jumps into star. That's how a star is born. Usually, that after all the gas is used up, leaves behind what we call an open star cluster. So the Pleiades is an object that can be seen in most areas, even in some light polluted areas. It's also known as the Seven Sisters. A lot of people actually confuse it for the Little Dipper at times because it kind of looks like a mini Little Dipper. Or someone said on the Star Party one, the Little Little Dipper. And the then, of course, of a billion years or so, they they drift away from one another, and they kind of finish making their solar system. They're already technically done. They're just adding a moon here and there. In this case, though, these stars were born so close together, they became gravitationally bound. Basically, their own mutual gravity is keeping them from drifting away from one another. It's like if two people held hands, then tried running in opposite directions. But none of them would let go. But that's happening with all these stars, about half a million of them. And they're stuck this way for their entire lives. Actually, stars are almost 12 billion years old, making them some of the oldest stars in our in our galaxy. And as I mentioned, the, the past galaxies, the Silver Street Galaxy, has many of them, about 700 of these. And these galaxy stars don't always stay nice apart. They can sometimes crash into each other. Sometimes the stars can crash into each other. They merge into a more massive star. With it being more massive, produces more energy, more heat, uh, will get hotter, it will appear blue in color, and become what we call a blue straggler. So even though our image is in black and white, the actual image is filled with lots of colors. Then we can actually use that for our dark sky purposes as well. But yeah, let's see the color image. See, there's yeah. lots of blues and yellows and reds. Yeah, very colorful object when if you have a color camera. Um, yeah, you can see that lots of blues and, and some of them are kind of an orangey color. So um, the color of a star, it tells you the temperature of the star. So if we have a little chart here, um, the, the hotter the star, the more blue it shines. So if you have a star around 20,000, 30,000 Kelvin or so, it'll start to shine pretty blue. And you can see some blue ones in this other example of a different cluster as well. Um, whereas the cooler stars are a bit more red. So that's the opposite of your AC or your faucet, right? Hot is blue and cold is red. Um, but for physics and astronomy, um, that's the way we like it. And as it turns out for light bulbs, it's actually, they use the same kind of scale, very similar scale. When you go to the hardware store and you look for a light bulb, you, uh, you, if you look on the back, you will see that the color is described in the Kelvin temperature scale. That's the correlated color temperature is the technical jargony name for that. Um, but the color temperature basically tells you what color it is. The, the more blue it is, the higher the number. The uh, more amber it is, the lower the number. And if you want like a neutral daylight, um, that's right around 5,000 or 6,000. That's what most people describe as daylight white. Um, whereas the uh, 2000 N is more on the kind of sunset colors. So um, the sun's temperature at the surface of the sun is 5000 Kelvin or about 5500, I should say. But let's round it off. Let's call it 5000 to make it a nice even number. Um, so uh, that's how hot the sun is, right? So why do we describe light bulbs the same way? Uh, well, it's basically... Um, how if the light bulb or if something were to be heated up to that temperature, that is the color it would emit. Uh, obviously, the light bulbs are not physically that hot. Uh, if, uh, your indoor light bulb was 5000 Kelvin. You're going to burn your house down and probably your neighbor's house, too. But 
Um, it's just describing the color. So when we look up at the daytime sun, indirectly, of course, um, the sky is blue, but the sun appears white uh, in the, at high noon. And the sky is blue because all of the blue end of uh, the spectrum is scattered more in the atmosphere. Um, and that's also why sunsets are red. The light comes at a, in at a lower angle, passing through more atmosphere, thus more blue scattered out, and it's the red that remains. So if the sun were cooler, if it were 2000 Kelvin or so, we may actually be able to see more stars even in the middle of the daytime because there wouldn't be as much blue hiding everything. The red doesn't scatter as much so we can still see things. Um, so yeah, when you look in our artificial light, the same thing applies. Uh, if you look at a, a daylight white colored uh, like parking lot light, if you look below them, you can kind of see how the blue is scattering as it goes down. Um, so all that blue light is just bouncing around. Uh, even if the light's aimed down, some of that light is going to go up into the sky. So blue light scatters around three and a half times more than red, and that's why the sky is blue. And it's the same reason why uh, locally we prefer to use kind of amber lights to help preserve our view of the night sky. So in this example, we swapped out the bulbs on this hotel uh, in Fort Davis with amber bulbs. Uh, and you can see um, not only are they shielded so there's less glare, um, but the amber color um, is a little easier or softer on the eyes. But that amber color, even if it's reflecting off the surface, still won't wash out the stars as much as the white one would. Here's another example, uh, Alpine Public Library that uses sort of the amber tones, uh, more on the uh, lower color temperature. Uh, and the example of a solar light, which uh, when you get solar powered lights, for whatever reason, they almost always are kind of daylight white. We put a filter over it to make it amber again to protect astronomy. And even large uh, facilities near us, uh, oil and gas facilities, uh, like this one, use a more amber color to avoid the light scattering and blocking our view of the stars, which we really appreciate. So we worked with oil and gas, the oil and gas industry. We've worked with local partners um, to consult on lighting to help review our, to help preserve our view of the night sky without compromising safety. So the two can coexist. Here's another example of an oil and gas facility um, that had unshielded lights. Uh, we shielded them all, aimed them all down, amber color, uh, which drastically reduced light pollution. By doing this at just this one facility, uh, we estimate we removed the equivalent of about a city of 2,000 people's worth of light pollution. Basically like removing 2,000 people's output, typically from the night sky, just this one facility by doing that. Um, so uh, lastly, on our... Um, Target list tonight is the faintest, most challenging target of them all, uh, known as Thor's Helmet, or NGC 2359. Definitely need dark skies to see this, and frankly, even with a big telescope, it's pretty challenging. A uh, camera helps a great deal to see this particular object. So how's it shaping up, Saul? Do you have it in there? So it's shaking, shaping up pretty well. I do want to give it a bit more time, so kind of yeah, just mentioned it is pretty dim, so do want to get a bit more light so we can see it better. And actually, to give us time, a question came in, kind of going back to kind of the color images, such as the one we showed of M3. So from R. Scott, do you use images from multiple filters to get the color images and combine them? Yes. So uh, we do, uh, to create the color image with a, with a black and white ca camera, uh, we typically take... Uh, an image with a blue filter, an image with a green filter, and an image with a red filter, and then combine them together to create the full color image. Um, so doing that, uh, it's a little more complicated, but you get a better, cleaner result than just taking it with a color camera. Um, you gather light a little more efficiently, so the image is a little cleaner. Um, so I saw someone asking for the link to that map. Um, Billy's Astro, you asked about that. I'm going to try to post that in the chat if I can, if it'll let me. Uh, and it's a rather unusual link. Um, so I'm posting that in the chat right now. 
Um, so that'll take you to the National Park Service map I uh, was showing you earlier, uh, which uh, is a little more accurate than some of the other maps out there that you can find if you were to just Google the topic. Yeah, and we will also try to add to our, we'll add to the description of this video. We'll update it with that link as well. Yeah. Right idea. I should add also that map is from 2018. It's a little bit old now, but it's still mostly accurate. Yeah. All right. I think we enough time has passed so we can get a good view. So I've been having basically the this has been exposed for about four minutes. So six, four 60 second images stacked on top of each other to be able to get detail in Thor's helmet. NGC, cool NGC 2359. So this object is about 12,000 light years away from us, about 15,000, uh, not 50,000, 15 light years across. And it's, as you see, it kind of looks like a helmet, like Thor's helmet. Might be more if you were an older fan of Marvel Comics, Thor's old style of helmet. This might be more reminiscent of it. So you got the helm itself and like the wings that go out to the side. And again, this object is very dim. Like you need a dark sky to be able to see something like this, even with how dark it is out here, even with the size of the telescope, even with a long exposure image, this is as much detail as we can get. While with so earlier, so someone asked the exposure times we're looking at things, most of the galaxies, with a 30 second exposure, we can get a good enough view. I'll swing 60 seconds just to get a bit nicer view. The Silver Street Galaxy and its friend was just one single 60 second exposure. You saw the details in there, the gas and such. The pinwheel also as well just needs a small exposure to even get the details like the gas and the star formation. We got about four minutes on this one. It isn't it's some cool, really, really cool detail. But you might not, you're not probably seeing as much as something like the pinwheel had. Yeah, you... Awesome. Yeah. Um, really cool object. I really like this one. Um, so, one way to help see this particular object uh, a little better, um, as um, the Fort Worth Astronomical Society says, is you can use what's called an O3 filter. Um, and this is a special piece of equipment that you put on the eyepiece of the telescope that only allows the light from. Uh, ionized oxygen through, which is this particular teal color. And that uh, helps improve the contrast a lot. Um, so here's an image of Thor's helmet in color uh, taken with an O3 filter as well as a hydrogen filter, which is the red color. Um, so that uh, improves the contrast a lot um, and, and kind of uh, helps uh, see a little more detail. So it works visually too, but without that, it's pretty hard to see. Um, so yeah, really awesome, very intricate object uh, formed from a uh, very massive star at the center called a wolf ray star. Um, and this particular one is about 13 times the mass of the sun uh, and much hotter. Uh, I mentioned the Kelvin scale earlier. This one is off the charts at 110,000 Kelvin, which is crazy hot. Um, so what's going on with this star is it's really massive, really big, 13 times the mass of the sun. That's, that's up there. And when massive stars begin to run out of fuel, um, the outer layers expand off and expose the hotter layers beneath, um, which uh, emit a, a tremendous amount of heat and radiation, energizing the cloud around it, making it glow. Uh, and probably not too long in astronomy time, maybe a few hundred thousand years, this star will explode and in a supernova and uh, maybe leave a black hole behind or maybe just uh, annihilate itself or maybe a neutron star, we're not sure, but it will probably detonate in a large supernova explosion. Whereas the first object we looked at was kind of uh, on the other end of the scale. It was a smaller star, it puffed up, but it won't explode. It will just puff away its outer layers and fade away. This one is puffing away its outer layers, and then it's going to explode. Um, so really cool, really detailed object. Um, but again, you need uh, dark skies to appreciate it. It is in the constellation of Canis Major. And if you want to see if you actually have a shot at seeing this in a telescope, um, step outside and look for Canis Major. 
you don't really need to necessarily know your constellations all that well. Um, Canis Major is the big dog, but if you don't see a dog shape, that's fine. Um, there's a program called Globe at Night. You can learn about it at globeatnight.org, where you can report how bright or dark your sky is based on how many stars you see. Globe at Night is a great citizen science project that really helps astronomers like, like uh, us here at McDonald Observatory understand light pollution and, and how it's spreading and changing with technology and development. Um, so if you go outside tonight and you look up and you find Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, you, you should be able to see Sirius pretty well as long as you have a clear shot at it. Um, if you see no other stars around it, you've got pretty light polluted skies. If you see a few, you know, kind of in the middle, you have, it's light polluted, but you can see a little bit. Um, it's kind of suburban skies. Under dark skies, um, the constellations are almost hard to find because there's so many extra stars. So if you go to this website, Globe at Night, uh, and you, um, you, there's a different constellation every month. This month it's actually Leo uh, rather than Canis Major. But they'll, you can find these star charts, and then you say, my sky looks like this, and then where you are and the time, et cetera. Using all of these uh, observations from around the world, just naked eye observations, no special equipment, no training. Uh, using this, astronomers have learned a lot about light pollution, uh, particularly about what's happening in urban areas, because satellites and other, are all our sophisticated instruments really just don't work all that well in that area. Uh, we don't, they can only see the light that's going up rather than the light that's going sideways, which is actually what's more relevant uh, a lot of the times from from the ground. So um, definitely check out Globe at Night. Uh, and also, um, I, would, I would just never forgive myself if I ended this program without talking about the solutions to light pollution and how to preserve our night sky, which I've already kind of hinted out throughout the program. Um, but those solutions are really simple. Shielding lights, aiming them down at the ground, not only preserves the sky, but improves visibility and safety by illuminating glare and putting more light where you actually need it and less where you don't. Using a more amber color reduces the scattering of the light. It also has less impact on insects and other uh, creatures of the night. Uh, using the intensity you need and no more. And the simplest thing, if you're not using a light, turning it off, uh, only using light that has a purpose. Doing all those things goes a long way to protecting the night sky. And as we've shown locally, uh, you don't have to live in darkness completely to enjoy a night sky. In our region of West Texas, um, we're celebrating the one year anniversary of the creation of the Greater Big Bend International Dark Sky Reserve. This is the largest area in the world where the night sky is protected. Um, so all of the regions in uh, and that are highlighted here are, are have adopted a lighting strategy that was basically what I just said, shielding, the color temperature, the intensity and the timing to reduce light pollution and preserve our view of the night sky. Um, so this is a massive area, 15,000 square mile area where the night sky is protected. And we hope to expand it if we can in the future. You can learn more about that and other things on our website, mcdonaldobservatory.org under dark skies. And uh, if you are able to visit next week for International Dark Skies Week, uh, definitely check us out, uh, mcdonaldobservatory.org. Uh, under the visit tab, we have our schedule for what we're doing April 18th to 22nd of next week. I hope you can uh, see you there. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap up tonight's program. But if you've got any questions for myself or Saul or our moderators, feel free to uh, ask away. Yeah. So actually one that came in, this seemed one right up your alley, Steven, being our angel of darkness here, you may have the answer. So from Juan Sanchez, I'm trying to resolve a light pollution nuisance emanating from a recently constructed commercial building near my home. I hate it. It's ruining the enjoyment of my patio and backyard. And I'm guessing they're asking what mm -hmm. can be steps they can what take to address that. Yeah, so um, Juan, um, I, I suggest uh, going to our website or, or the Dark Sky Reserve website. We have some tips on how to talk to your neighbors. Um, start off with finding an example of good lighting in your community. 
um, if, or, or using one of the examples on our website, um, some of which I highlighted in this program, to show people kind of what you're talking about. It's a highly visual topic. Um, so if you just, you know, come out of the gate talking about lumens and color temperature, you're going to lose them. But if you, if you uh, have pictures and show examples, it goes a long way. Um, and always, of course, just stay, stay polite. Most people just don't realize uh, that, you know, that they're causing an issue. Um, it's still a pretty niche topic in the grand scheme of things. Most people just don't know about it. Um, so show examples and be polite and offer a clear solution. So instead of saying fix it and then leaving it to them to figure out what you want, um, you could offer a specific product uh, or even just if, you know, I've done this in neighbor situations, just give them the light that you would want them to try out and say, give it a shot. If you don't like it, give it back. But typically they, you know, they, they like it. So, um, and uh, the last thing, um, kind of a sales tip, just leave something physical behind when you talk to them. That could be a pamphlet, a brochure, or, you know, bullet points of what you discussed. It could be a plate of cookies, brownies, whatever you want. Um, just a little physical reminder that they may see later that kind of triggers in their mind. Oh yeah, I talked to I talked to Juan about this. I, I need to get on this and learn more um, so they don't forget. Um, so again, yeah, more resources on our website on how to do that. Um, I also recommend darksky.org. That's for the International Dark Sky Association. They have a list of approved fixtures, which is probably very relevant for a commercial property as well. So here's one from Bully with, uh, are these streams posted to the YouTube channel? So they are. So all streams we have here and have done here on the YouTube channel remain on our YouTube channel. So here at McDonald's Observatory on YouTube, you can find the past live streams we've done. Actually for March, we did one about books. So just astronomy themed and related books from, from factual. So just to learn more about it, nonfiction, science fiction from from kinder preschool all the way up to like adulthood we've all done streams about some other topics such as galaxies we've done streams from some other telescopes such as one from the hobby everly telescope so feel free to go through and look look around and if you want to see some other examples of kind of some deep sky optics and how we relate them to dark sky preservation you can check out our live stream from April of last year to see a bit more of those. Oh, and let's see from Fourth Earth Astronomical Society. Are we doing a live stream for the October eclipse? So as of right now, there are no plans to do a live stream for the eclipse. We're just trying to work out what type of event we'll do, how many people come out here to the visitor center. We are hoping to maybe help out in areas that are having that annular eclipse, such as the Midland Odessa area. But as of right now, there really isn't a plan for a stream for the eclipse. I should add on that eclipse, we aren't here in the path of totality, unfortunately. So um, we'll have a partial eclipse, which uh, it's cool, but it's it's not the same. Yeah, yeah we, we highly recommend to go to the path of totalities for the eclipses, even whether annual or total, but definitely the total of the eclipse. It's almost literally a nine day difference between a 99% coverage and 100% coverage. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's been a lot of fun, and I uh, hope you guys can come out and see us uh, next week for Dark Skies Week. Um, clear skies, everybody. Yeah. Have a good night, everyone.